meeting with the media and you have a very difficult job to do as the media sometimes through your work um, as hard as it is people lose their lives this is how difficult it is for the media um, and so before we we really proceed I want to ask in honor of the memory of members of the media who've lost their lives in, in carrying out their job to keep, get up and let us have a minute silence before we proceed. May their souls and those of all who have departed rest in perfect peace. Amen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the media. I warmly welcome you to our maiden media encounter. The notice I know was short and you responded. Particularly exciting is that media practitioners from the 16 regions of our country are duly represented here tonight. I am grateful that you've traveled that far and near to listen to me speak and ask the critical questions agitating your minds. And those of our people. This engagement tonight was originally planned for June 26, 2024 to be suspended to make way for a broader consultation, the choice also of my running mate, and the launch of our manifesto, all of which have now been completed. The media plays an important role in the democratic process, and those seeking to govern our nation must be interested in part partnering with the media to ensure accountability, dissemination of ideas, and critical scrutiny of public policy proposals. The MPP views the media as an important ally in our national development agenda and our quest to expand the frontiers of democratic governance in Ghana. It is thus the MPP, it was thus the MPP under President John Jekum Kufu that repealed the criminal libel law to allow, in addition to the rights guaranteed by the 1992 Constitution, for the media to fully perform its functions. Again, Another MPP president, Nanado Dankwa Kufuado, passed the right to information law to enhance the work of the media. We are partners with you, and a partnership I will continue to keep as the new leader of the MPP. Ladies and gentlemen, as you are aware, in November last year, I was elected as the presidential candidate of the new patriotic party for the December 2024 elections. In my campaign for the flag bearership, you offered me extensive coverage and this um, resulted in no small way in my decisive victory. Since then, I have traveled the country and engaged with fellow citizens on the way forward for our nation. I've met with traditional rulers, religious rulers, students, market women, the youth, and many identifiable groups. I've listened to the great ideas they shared with me. Some have asked questions about the performance of our government in the last seven years. Some have praised the remarkable achievements of President Akufuado, 
Similarly, some have offered advice. I've also taken advantage of my engagements to recount the many successes of the government of President Akufuado. I have also, in my encountered, encounters, acknowledged the economic difficulties citizens have faced, from, especially between 2020 and 2022, and the interventions we've made to bring back the economy. Last week, the MPP presented its 2024 manifesto in Takradi. In our manifesto, we have laid down comprehensive economic proposals to sustain the rebounding economy, reduce the cost of living, stabilize the currency, empower businesses and reform the tax administration and deliver jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, we are committed to deepening media freedoms and plurality. Recognizing the vital role of the media in promoting democratic governance and economic development and in preventing disinformation in the digital age, in line with our philosophy and reaffirming our commitment to upholding the fundamental right to free speech and media freedoms and expanding the frontiers of individual rights, we will pass and fully implement the Broadcasting Bill, if not done before the final session of Parliament this year, to better safeguard media freedoms and pluralism. Further, resource the Media Capacity Enhancement Program to continue enhancing the knowledge and skills of journalists, continue to implement the coordinated mechanism for the safety of journalists, strengthen public media, including uh, GBC, GNA, community radio, and other public media institutions to promote diverse perspectives and voices, to modernize and retool the information services department to enhance its effectiveness, better resource the National Media Commission to execute its mandate, and enhance access to information by facilitating right to information requests by the media petitioners and citizens who cannot afford access to information. We also want to preserve our heritage by working with tourism, creative arts, and heritage stakeholders to embark on a massive archival project to protect our historic forms and documents. Finally, harmonize public relations at all ministries, departments, and agencies to promote effective communication. Ladies and gentlemen, I represent the future, and Ghana needs an upgrade and not a reset. And so, I've also outlined my 14 key commitments to the Ghanaian people. These are to sustain and expand Ghana's rebounding economy, create new jobs, implement wide-ranging tax reforms, build Ghana into a world-class digital economy, reduce the cost of living, expand public infrastructure, provide better health care for all, implement affirmative action for women and girls, and expand educational opportunities for all. Provide good governance, care for the elderly, protect our environment, boost sports, creative arts, and tourism, protect our borders while keeping our neighborhoods safe. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is an opportunity for the media to thoroughly examine the proposals in our manifesto and offer criticisms where necessary. We are ready to listen. Let me take advantage of your presence here to state my firm commitment to free, fair, and peaceful elections in December. The quest for political power should not be an end in itself. It should be mounted on the desire 
to transform lives and make Ghana, our motherland, a better place for us all. However, it is becoming increasingly worrying that some people have gained the notoriety of churning out incendiary language, threatening fire and brimstone if the good people of Ghana give the mandate to rule to a group other than theirs. Whilst nobody profits from violence and chaos, it bears repeating that not a single drop of Ghanaian blood should be sacrificed for power. Our party is determined to pitch our ideas as we have always done and to demonstrate the superiority of our ideas over and above what any other party can offer. My pledge and that of the MPP is to run a campaign of ideas and to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of a democratic group. Our main goal is that at the end of the contest, we carry on with our lives secure in the knowledge that there is work to do, work to sustain the rebounding economy. To those who threaten war, mayhem and violence, my message to them is that this isn't Ghanaian. Our pursuit of power must be paired with the compelling need to allow the Ghanaian to continue to enjoy his or her peace. Ghana will exist long after we've all left the scene. Thank you for your attention, and I'll see the microphone and take your questions. Thank you very much. Like they say these days, ladies and gentlemen, very mindful, very cutesy, and very demure. Please put your hands together for the Vice President of the Republic of Ghana. We now cede the microphones to our friends from the media. And please, the numbers as we all acknowledge, it's quite huge. And so we have the microphones in the various lanes. You lift your hands, then we'll call you. Then you speak. But before anything, I think it's only fair that we let the Vice President of the GJ speak first, and then the flag gates will be open. Let's be very brief with the questions. Please, Madam. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. This engagement has been a long-standing one. It is something that we've been yearning for for a very long time. And thank God that you've paved the way for us today to have this engagement. Thank you so much on behalf of the Ghana Journalists Association. I have two simple questions to ask you, Your Excellency. What is your commitment to media freedom? And how would you urge your supporters to refrain from attacking journalists, especially during electioneering, as we are in some few months to go? And also, how will you deal with your supporters who act in such a manner? The second question, Your Excellency, the media industry in, is currently facing serious financial distress. Some media houses are folding up and there are hints of imminent sale of state-owned media. What are your thoughts on selling the state-owned media and how would you help the media industry to overcome the financial distress if you are elected as president? Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you. So only the DJ has to ask two questions, please. Gordon, we'll take about six questions, then His Excellency would respond, then we'll come to you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I'll keep my questions short as myself. 
Your Excellency, uh, former President Mahama says you were supposed to be an economic messiah, uh, but you seem to have failed in the management of the economy. Do you have any response? Okay. In Sempera, I see at least we get Eastern region. So we'll keep moving. Thank you, His Excellency. My name is in Sempera, Emmanuel Marty. And I work with Afima FM in Kofuridia, the Eastern Regional Capital. My question is very simple and short. Is there anything you have disagreed with in this government as a vice president? Thank you. Eugene from uh, Ashanti Region, Insha FM. Good evening, um, everyone. Good evening, Mr. Vice President. My name is Eugene Osetutu. I work at Love FM in Kumase, subsidiary of the Multimedia Group. Um, listening to you last Sunday and also reading your manifesto and you're giving us an abridged version, when you go to the page 23 and 24, you are tackling the rising cost of living basically on four legs. Food, then you talk about transportation, you talk about housing and also electricity. Now on transportation, your solution is bringing in, one of your solutions is bringing in electric vehicles for public transport. And uh, last Sunday, you did indicate that you're expecting about 100 of them before December. I have three questions on that. We know EV vehicles are mostly charged. We have public charging systems that we use to, you know, power these buses to ply our roads. When you check the Energy Commission website as of this, this evening, we have only five public charging ports in the country, five. And two of them are actually for Porsche cars specifically. Then one at the total energy station at the Bridge Road. So between now and December, where are we building the charging port? Is it government building it? What is the source of fund? Is it the private sector or is it PPP? So that's my question one. Thank you. you have, then question you have, two. You have you no, know, under it. And I am not done. So is, it, for, is it directly related to EV? Yes, it's the EV. Let's it's refer to, to the others and make it short. Okay. So still on the EV, we know that most of these charging ports for green mobility innovations, they must be powered with green energy. So are we already adding on to our energy mix, which is the brown, making it counterproductive or we build dedicated solar panels for this charging port? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I think we'll go to the, this side before we come back. So what about first? Don't worry, we'll keep moving to every row. Thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Vice President, so throughout your campaign, I have noticed that you've been talking about uh, job creation and support for businesses. I've also uh, taken the pain to read all the 260-page uh, manifesto that you launched a week ago. And I see that uh, the golden thread in that manifesto is also the creation of jobs. But the young people in Ghana are asking, really, where would they find themselves in that uh, manifesto? How are you going to create jobs for the young people of this country? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think Excellency will take the questions and then we'll come back. We don't have the chance. Your Excellency, six questions. Thank you very, very much. I think uh, those are pretty tough questions. Um, the first question by the Vice President of the GJA <clears throat> was on commitment to media freedom. Um, and I think that commitment is very absolute, I think. The, the press and, and the I mean, people have fought and have lost their lives even to get press freedom or media freedom in this country. Um, a lot of the times we take it for granted, but I think that media freedom and, 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 and is so pivotal to the whole democratic exercise that we are embarked on. If you don't have media freedom, you, 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 you'll have a, a difficulty. I mean, that's, the, the lack of media freedom is a characteristic of you know, societies which are more dictatorial. And I think one of the uh, things about Ghana that everybody who comes here 
really appreciates uh, is the freedom of, of the media. We, you, we talk a lot on radio, TV all day. And so I'm very committed to this because I'm uh, inherently someone who is very committed to democracy. And I don't think that anyone should attack a member of the press uh, for doing their job. And so we will totally be against that and uh, ask all our supporters they, to refrain absolutely from, from doing that because that undermines the very democracy that we, we, we are doing, you know. So I think that one is, is clear. Um, the issue of sterling state-owned media, I, I'm not aware that anything of that nature has come to cabinet, but should it come, there has to be a ju justification for it. We will await any such um, thing that, that will come. I'm not uh, aware that there, there's a, a, a you know, proposal uh, to, to sell uh, the state-owned media. Uh, but if it, it comes, it has to be justified, and of course a big decision like that will have to be undertaken with a lot of consultation of, of stakeholders. Um, the third question, uh, as I said, yeah, third question is about what the former uh, president is uh, supposed to have said uh, about me being an economic messiah, supposedly, uh, who has failed. Um, sometimes I get a little surprised and, uh, and amazed uh, the former president when he talks about economic mismanagement because <laughs> he, should, he, he, he should know his own record. I mean, we don't all have short memories. We really don't all have short memories. His record in economic management, what he left us with in 2016 was an abysmal record. It's just an abysmal record. We had endured doom so for four years with all the destruction of industry and livelihoods that happened. People died because of doom so in hospitals. The National Health Service was virtually collapsed. Remember, we are basically back to a cash and carry system. The National Ambulance Service was virtually dead. We had on maybe about 37 ambulances for the whole country. Unemployment as a result was very high. Agriculture, GDP growth had declined to 3.4%. 3.4%. Agricultural growth had declined to 2.9%. And of course, industry growth had collapsed because of doom so. Unemployment was high. There was a freeze on public recruitment as a result. And the banking sector was virtually was on the verge of collapse. We had, as a result, the cancellation of teacher training allowances the cancellation of nursing training allowances. You had a three-month pay policy for teachers who could work for three years and be paid. And many children could not attend senior high school because of difficulties of paying fees and so on. You had many, many challenges that he left us with. You know, so when you juxtapose that record with what we have been able to do in these last eight years almost. It's really night and day. You know, we have created at least 2.1 million jobs. Uh, the latest number I saw was 2.3 million. But let's say at least 2.1 million jobs in the last seven years and this is hard data i'm talking about 2.1 
million jobs. We've kept the public sector workers employed and fully paid through the COVID pandemic. We didn't lay anybody off. And if you look at it, we've built more roads, more roads, three times more the length of roads than what he did in office. We've built more railway than any other government in the Fourth Republic. Expanded rural telephony. There were 78 sites for rural telephony when we came in. Today there are 1,008 sites for rural telephony. We built more libraries, public libraries, than any other government. I mean, his time he built only three, eight years, three public libraries, eight years. And we've built 54 public libraries in eight years. We've constructed about 12 major fish landing sites across the country. Exim, Dixco, Marie, Mumford, Winneba, Senyabriku, Gomoa, Fete, Teshi, Osu, Ikumfi, and Infasima. Constructed two fishing harbors in Elmina and Jamestown. Constructed more sanitation facilities, 817, than any other government in the Fourth Republic. This has increased the proportion of the population with access to toilet facilities from 33% in 2016 to 80%. And 5,400 communities have been declared open defecation free. We've built more sports facilities in Ghana than any other government in the Fourth Republic. Mm. Whether you're talking about Boteman or the University of Ghana and so on. When we came into office, there were only three astroturfs in the whole of Ghana. The whole of Ghana, three. Today you have over 150. We've abolished the three-month pay policy, constructed 120 courts we are constructing. 80 have been completed with bungalows. Um, and we've kept the lights on large, broadly in, in the last eight years. We've restored teacher and nursing training allowances. We've increased the beneficiaries of scholarships by 70%. And the national health insurance is now being extended to cover sickle cell patients with hydroxyurea, very expensive drug, but I led the negotiations for that to happen. We have extended the national health insurance to cover childhood cancer, extended the national health insurance to cover kidney dialysis for over 60s and under 18s. We saved the deposits of 4.6 million bank depositors who, who really um, we're going to lose their deposits if those banks were not, were not saved. I don't understand whether the former president has taken his time to actually understand what happened in the banking sector. Some atrocious things happened. And this is why these banks had to be saved. They were not collapsed. They were merged into other banks. And we, no banking depositor lost one city. Everybody maintained. But you had um, very bad things happening. You know, some of the banks broke all the rules and extended loans way above the single obligor limits. They were given, in some cases, one billion CDs by the Bank of Ghana to help them get out of the mess, and they only got deeper into the mess. Another bank was giving capital to save the situation, was giving money from the Bank of Ghana's lender of last resort facility, and they used that money to go and set up capital bank in sort of rescuing the problem that they had. They, went, they took the money from the central bank and went to set up another bank, which was also collapsing. Some took money and went and invested in private property. 
So, so it was against this background when the, the governor came to report, and this was one of the, the, my nightmares as in the last eight years. I couldn't sleep that night that the banking system, our, most people didn't understand how close we were to a collapse of the entire banking system, but we were this close because all it would have taken was for a few depositors to go to UT Bank or UMT and they'll tell you there's no money. What would happen? There would have been a complete run on the banking system in Ghana. We would have lost, we would have collapsed the banking system. When the governor came to report that we were on the verge of collapse, decisions had to be taken to save the banking system and to save depositors. And this is how come we had to merge many of these banks into other banks. To save. And we saved 4.6 million depositors. I will ask the former president, if he hasn't read, to go and read the receiver's report, or to go and read the Bank of Ghana report, and acquaint himself <laughs> before making any further comments on matters he clearly does not understand. He needs to get an understanding before you make comments. And you cannot hand over a bank's license to them. This is subject to legal procedure. <laughs> you have to go to court. You, you don't have the power in our constitution to do that. And I, I'm surprised sometimes because he has been president before and he should know these things. He should know these things. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have tripled the capitation grant per child since we came into office from five CDs to 15 CDs. And what is interesting also is that we've had the lowest increase in electricity tariffs in recent history. Between his time, 2009 and 2016, when they were in office, the average annual increase in electricity tariffs was 50% a year. That's the average. Some of the years were 80%. Between 2009 and 2016, 50% average a year. In the last eight years, the average increase in electricity prices has been 11.1 percent. This is the lowest average increase of any government since 1992. Any government since 1992. When we came in, we bought, in our first term, we abolished and reduced 21 separate taxes. And we reduced import duties by 50 percent between 2019 and 2021. 50 percent reduction in import duties. And that, of course, we had to go back on that when we got into the crisis. We introduced the National Rental Assistance Scheme to help to deal with this problem of rent advance. And it is one of the best schemes that we have seen. It has worked very well, and we are going to expand it um, for the rest of the country. We are going to put in serious money. Because with that, you don't need to pay two years rent advance. Uh, we will uh, uh, pay the landlord and you just pay monthly. Um, and it's working, and then, of course, working with the private sector. Infant mortality under our government has come down from 37.9 in 2016 to 31.7. And in terms of leap, livelihood empowerment against poverty, we have increased payments almost tenfold from 49 million that we used to pay every year to 423 million leap payments. Now, national health insurance, NHIS expenditure has also gone up from 1.1 billion to 6.8 billion. During COVID, we had free water for everybody for a year and free electricity for lifeline consumers and all of that. We brought in over 4 million beneficiaries now under school feeding, up from 1.6 million. 
have absorbed the examination fees for all students of BC and WACSI. People were sacked from examination centers for not paying examination fees before we came into office. We've doubled the number of student loan recipients from 30,000 to 58,000, almost double. We've also, of course, introduced mobile money interoperability to make every, almost every adult Ghanaian have a bank account uh, through the Momo's account interoperability with the bank account. In fact, the whole of Africa, Ghana, is the only country with 100% access to financial inclusion. 100%. The whole of Africa, Ghana, is the only country with 100% access to financial inclusion. What is interesting is that when I first made a statement and I said Ghana was the first country in Africa to have mobile money interoperability between banks and Momo accounts, uh, some people decided to fact check me. And they said that I was wrong. But just that they didn't understand the, the, the terrain, the fact checkers. So I took my time to explain to the fact checkers exactly what was happening in the field. Unfortunately, once they understood it, they didn't come back to withdraw. <laughs> they just kept quiet. You know, today, when chalk was a problem, remember, chalk in our schools, under the former president, when it was a problem, today we have acquired tablets to give to the students. Every senior high school student is getting a tablet that we, we, we are having. So I'm just putting some of these points together. You know, Agenda 111 so far, we've built 47 hospitals, 428 CHIPS compounds, 230 health centers. I mean, that is massive. That's excluding Agenda 111. We've brought in drone delivery, and Ghana is now the whole world, the largest medical de drone delivery service in the whole world. We are leading uh, the world. The ambulance service, which was collapsing, we've brought in one constituency, one ambulance, and we are making a lot of um, progress in that direction. So I think that, I mean, what is clear, I, I, I don't have to go through every sector. I, the data, for me, I speak only with data. The data is very, very clear that we have our government, we have outperformed the government of former President Mahama in the management of the economy in virtually every sector. Virtually every sector. You tell me whether it's GDP growth, whether it's per capita income, whether it is industry growth. I mean, virtually every sector we have outperformed. So he either does not read or he does not understand the data. He needs to do one of the two. Take his time to read the data and understand what it is before he comes out to speak, because he will speak out of ignorance. Because if you understand the data, and I believe that as a former president, he does understand the data. He must understand the data. And I believe that is why he doesn't want to debate me. I believe so. That is why he doesn't want to debate me. He's, uh, he's running away from that. But, so if, according to him, our, we have mismanaged the economy in the midst of a global crisis, in the midst of a global crisis, if our mismanaged economy is outperforming you in virtually every sector. This economy that you are saying has been mismanaged. We are performing you in GDP growth, in per capita income, in G gross international reserves, in every sector, roads, hospitals, schools, everything. 
free SHS, all of that. If this is the mismanaged economy that is outperforming you in your economy that had no global crisis, no crisis at all, but you couldn't afford chalk. You couldn't afford chalk, but there was no crisis. So if our mismanaged economy is performing better than your, man, your better managed economy, uh, then <laughs> in that case, you, you must not have been very good. Let me put it mildly. I was going to say incompetent. Because <laughs> our bad economy is very, it's much better than your good economy. I mean, it doesn't make sense. You know, so I think that the matter, I hope that this matter can be settled. There, 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 there's no way, there's no way he can say that his economy, that he managed as, as president, by the way, I'm not yet president, in another three months, inshallah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let, let us settle this matter. And you are members of the press. You, you read the data. You follow the data. You know the data. You know that we have done better than him. So why does he want to come back? I mean, it's like you go for an exam with someone in school. You score 70%, they score 30%. And they want to convince people that they are better than you. It doesn't make sense in, the, in that sense. So I, I, I seriously believe that that, that statement, you know, um, th that we have failed. Uh, of course, we've had challenges. Nobody can say we haven't had challenges. We, we have had challenges. Serious challenges, challenges that have kept me up at night. In 2022, that was the horrible year for us, 2022. Petrol prices went up to 23 CDs per liter. We were losing reserves so badly, you know, and you saw food prices going up and all of that. That was a real challenge that we had to deal with. And this is how we came up with the whole gold for oil, gold purchase program, and that has really helped us. Today, Ghana, today, notwithstanding all the challenges, we are the 10th lowest price in terms of petroleum in Africa, the whole of Africa. Ghana is number 10 in those of lowest prices of petroleum products. We are number 10. Tenth lowest. The lowest is Libya. Then you move through Egypt and Sudan and all of those to come to number 10, which is Ghana. Ghana, we are priced around 13, 14 CDs per liter right now. Cote d'Ivoire is priced 23 CDs per liter, as uh, Hassan was just telling me earlier on when I asked. You know, tenth lowest. Uh, we, are, we still want to bring it lower. But in 2022, at the time I announced the Gold for Oil program, when I said we had to attack this thing with Gold for Oil, the prices were 23 CDs per liter at that time. So um, we've had challenges. It's not, uh, everything is, is not where we want it to be, but I believe that we can work better. But I don't think the former president can lecture us on economic management. He just cannot. His record would not allow him to lecture us on economic management. Is there anything you have disagreed <laughs> with in this government? Um, the issue um, when you sit in cabinet, you have collective responsibility. That is fundamental to governance. When we sit in cabinet, we argue on many, many issues. And everybody brings their mind. 
And sometimes your view prevails, sometimes it doesn't prevail. But once we take a decision, it is a collective decision. And so I cannot come out and say that the decision that we collectively took, I disagree with. No, I'm bound by it. That is the nature of cabinet <laughs> responsibility. The question had to do with the rising cost of living, and I'm very happy you are raising these issues um, on the EV, electronic, uh, electric vehicles. Um, you're right, one of the ways that we want to reduce the cost of living is through bringing in public transportation, the electric buses. And, you know, so that is what is going on. We are bringing in about 100 to start with to essentially do the pilot for it. Um, and the issue that you raise is a very, very fundamental one which is the charging stations for these electric buses. Uh, and I must tell you that Metromas uh, is working very, very hard as we speak uh, to put in the charging stations. So we will have the charging stations in place uh, by the time uh, the buses get here. So that is clearly a very, very important one. Um, and the issue of green energy, um, whether you're going to, to try to bring in uh, solar to charge um, these batteries, I think it, it is definitely going to be important. Um, as, because in general, if you read that particular chapter, I want Ghana to move towards solar power. And this is where I think we should be going. And this is why I want us to bring in 2,000 megawatts of solar power uh, in the next four years to, to really bring down the cost of power. And we've seen some work already being done by Bui Power uh, in terms of the solar area, but we're going to really expand it. So in terms of all these buses, all these uh, government buildings, all the schools and so on, I want to move them all towards green energy solar power, and I think that is where we should, we should be going. Um, I think that um, the, the other question was on job creation um, for the young people. I think that is at the heart of, of the manifesto, that you want to essentially um, move to create the environment and the, put in place the policies that will help business and that will help jobs, right? So that's why we're talking about bold solutions for business and jobs. I think that is so critical. Uh, and I think that there are many areas that we are, we are touching on uh, for the young people to get the jobs. We, 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 I think that, I mean, the, the two are very linked, business and jobs. If you let businesses grow, then the jobs will also be created. And so we are looking at helping businesses grow um, by putting together our uh, implementing uh, our legally backed uh, Ghana First policy so that the procurement by the public will be focused on things that are produced in Ghana first before they look outside. So that is a very important part of the, the, the policy mix that we are coming with, that will make people hire more and will get uh, more jobs in, in that sense. Uh, we also have a major tax program um, that of tax reform uh, to make the business environment very, very good uh, and easy to comply with. So we are bringing in a flat tax system uh, as exists in Estonia, uh, we, have, we are also bringing in a tax amnesty for business um, so that we can all start on a clean slate and, and move forward. We believe that, you know, training the youth will be very, very important. So the investment that we are making in TVET will continue. Um, the focus, we're setting up um, an open university with a focus on ICT, TVET, and also um, 
the, the, the whole STEM area as well. So we want to, to, to do that, but we also um, are trying to get our youth trained in digital skills. I have a program for one million youth to be trained in digital skills, um, uh, which is a broad area of training uh, for the youth, because the jobs these days are more increasingly more in that space. And I think that we can have a situation where a lot of our youth are here and they are working in America or the US or Canada uh, right from, from Ghana here and, and so on. So, so these are some of the areas that we think we are going to, 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 to get going, um, the infrastructure area and so on, that will expand the economy uh, so that we can create more jobs for our, our people. And of course, setting up the SME bank, setting up you know, the credit scoring system to allow people to get credit and move Ghana towards that system. Uh, we may have some time to talk more about some of these, but these are some of the areas we want to, to get the youth uh, totally uh, involved and empowered to get jobs. Thank you very much. I'll take the next step. Thank you. Your Excellency. But at this point, Your Excellency, we are going to time you because if we follow the former president, you will talk, sir. We are going to time you just as we are going to time Bella Mundi at this point. Bella, please ask your question. Good evening, and thank you so much for the opportunity. I was listening to you respond to some of the questions earlier, and one of my questions was touched on, so I guess I'll move on to the next one. But just to piggyback off job creation, one of the major aspects of job creation under the MPP is the NAPCO program. And quite recently, you would recall, sir, that they were threatening to go on a demonstration because they were owed nine months arrears. Now, even Hill Ghana, and this is something I followed keenly, so I've had conversations with them. Hill Ghana, even before the nine months, were owed seven months. And so if you combine the two, they're complaining that they haven't been paid 16 months arrears. And that's a major problem. What do you intend to do about it? And if I can quickly, this was just a piggyback. No, so no Bella, I have one question. If, like, if I could just so that, so that briefly. Fianco, so that Fianco can come. I'll come back to you okay. if there's the opportunity. Thank you, Fianco. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Your Excellency. I, I want to take my question from your manifesto for this year's election. And I'm looking at provide better health care for all. Now, you did mention that you were going to offer incentives for healthcare, healthcare workers to buy one vehicle each with engine capacity up to 1.8 liter. Now, for clarity purpose, is it that these vehicles, they would buy them outside and they will be duty free? If that is it, we know we have about five automobile companies in this country. Your government brought them how would this policy boost their production and also enhance the kind of people they want to work with? Because if they are going to import these cars, we are not really helping them. Thank you, I'm grateful. Um, hey, let, me, let me remove my camera. Um, before I proceed to ask my questions, I would like to um, emphatically state that these questions were not given to me by anyone here. Um, they are from my head, so I'm going to ask. Now, uh, Mr. Vice President, my name is Koji Sheldon. I represent Koji Sheldon Studios. Um, the first one is about 322 pharmaceutical doctors uh, on social media right now are planning on suing the health ministry. Uh, about unpaid you know allowances now for someone that has highlighted in your manifesto that when voted into power you are going to you know improve or help improve the condition of services when it comes to conditions of service when it comes to our health people for right now that you are the vice president what can you do to help these pharmaceutical you know uh, doctors who are you know contemplating on suing uh, the ministry of you know health my second question borders. No, no, could you? Oh, oh, don't oh. do that to me. Mr. Oh, no, no. Mr. Oh, 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 Mr. Oh,
one question. So my question, question, the second question is about don't, perception. Don't do that. Boss. Don't do that. Oh, but don't do that. The, 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 I didn't allow Bella. perception is very, very, very important. I'll come back to you. I'll come oh. back to you. Daniel I can say. I'll come back to you. Daniel I can say. I can say film. Good evening, Your Excellency. My name is Nana Yakesi. I work with PCFM. You have promised abolishing bed tax, e levy, flat, import duty, one time tax amnesty, among others. If you really believe that that is what Ghana needs, why should we wait till you become the president and not implement it now? to go to this I see some celadi <laughs> good evening your excellency so my my question is coming from a group of students on scholarship abroad they are concerned that the scholarship secretariat is not doing what it has to do for them. At page 27 of your manifesto, you speak about harmonizing public uh, scholarships. And there's a purpose for it. You say the purpose is to give full visibility. Beyond the visibility, what will you do about this now and not later? They, they are some of them for 20 months they have not received their stipends in a number of universities in the UK in Warwick Coventry Nottingham they are under threat of losing their studentship in Birmingham 11 of them have already been withdrawn and they are facing deportation Will you inquire, particularly knowing about the Fourth Estate's investigations dubbed Scholarship Bonanza, about what appears to be a racketeering in that place? And will you forbid and prohibit politically exposed persons wealthy enough, known in society, think from accessing the, these thank scholarships? You, thank you. I think the question is very well. Let me go to. Um, the regions. We've done plenty Accra. Western North. Please, give the microphone to the Western North guy. We've done Eastern. we we'll do Western North. We'll do the other regions as well. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Esposito Inoke Dusei. I work with the Beat FM. Somewhere in last year, the former president Mahama on his campaign tour in Western North region claimed Cocoa Board is on the verge of collapse. Do you believe Cocoa Board has collapsed? And what is your plans for Cocoa Board? I don't want to go deep. Thank you. Thank you. Sabi Yafi. Dr. Sensei, good evening. Thank you very much. My name is Sami Yafi. I work with CTFM and Channel 1 TV. Um, so a few meters away from us is the site for the construction of the National Cathedral. We know huge sums of money have been sunk into the project. What will you do about it if or when you become president of this country? Thank you very much. Excellency, please take these questions and then. Thank you very much. Let me uh, take them in the order in which they were asked. I think that um, the first question had to do with NAPCO, um, the Nation Builders Corps in the areas that uh, have been owed um, to, to NAPCO. Um, I think that the, the program had about 100,000 
people on it. And I, I think initially it was supposed to be uh, a three-year program um, and then would be renewed and so on. But I think that so far, out of the 100,000 that were taken, 34,000 have exited into permanent jobs under NAPCO. And the others are, are, are still, but I think that the issue that uh, Bella raises is the arrears and, and how we are going to deal with it. I've raised this issue this, because this is not really uh, there's some information that has come to me already about the areas in the NAPCO program, and I've raised this issue um, with the Minister for Finance um, and, and trying to, to persuade them to, to, to make uh, these areas payments. So we will follow that up on behalf of the, the NAPCO uh, employees. The second issue had to do with the providing better health care in the manifesto and the issue of cars and how these um, will affect local companies. I think that what is very clear uh, when you look at the manifesto is that we, we did not really say it was only for imported. The incentives would only be for imported vehicles uh, because you just said you provide incentives. Clearly, under President Kufuo, there were incentives to, for healthcare workers and also for teachers to bring in vehicles, uh, and they will waive the import duty, and that basically uh, worked but was abused. Um, we think that with digitalization and the unique identity of people, we can better monitor. Um, this situation. But the issue um, is that we need to be able to see how these, uh, quant these teachers and these nurses could also acquire with the necessary incentives from the local manufacturing companies. I mean, as you know, the numbers of teachers and nurses are very, very large relative to the production capacity of some of the firms here. But we are leaving that open to discuss with them and with the manufacturing companies here to see how we can incentivize. Our preference clearly is to buy local. Um, and so we will work with them to see how best, uh, if they can meet um, the um, terms in terms of production on time and all of that. I think we will try to incentivize them. But we will leave it open um, for discussion, and that's what we've done. Um, the other issue um, was that we wanted to do these tax reforms, import duty, flat tax, tax amnesty, and so on. But why don't I do it? now and and why do i want to i must have a manifesto otherwise if i do everything now <laughs> if i could <laughs> what would i do when i come into office <laughs> i mean how can you Do everything. Even President Mahan talked about the scholarship 
uh, students and, and, and all of that. And I think this is a very, very important issue. Um, there's nothing more heart-wrenching than taking a student abroad and not being able to take care of them um, in, in, in those circumstances. And I think that, that Um, I believe, and uh, this is what we mean, that one all the beneficiaries of, of all of these uh, scholarships as they come, so that everybody knows who is getting the scholarships and so on. Um, and again, uh, I've been, um, been made very aware of this issue. It's not, um, it's not new, um, because students have even, and parents have gotten in touch with me. Uh, about the awards and, and, and the scholarships and so on. So we're talking with the uh, Ministry of Finance and the Scholarship Secretariat. Uh, I think they were able to, to make some payments to, to some of the UK students and so on. But we will follow up on that because it's very urgent. Um, um, Cocoa Board is on the verge of collapse. Um, I'm, not, I'm not aware of that, uh, but uh, we'll, we will, we'll, we'll look at that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I cannot comment on that. Um, it's, it's not, um, I, I don't know where the data is coming from. Um, then the National Cathedral. Uh, National Cathedral, um, again, is a very, very important issue for, because, I mean, taxpayers' money has gone into it, and many people would like to see it uh, completed. And I believe that one should have um, an engagement with the churches and all the stakeholders for us to see how best to, to, to get the funding to complete the project. But I think that um, we need to sit down and talk if it has to, if the design has to be looked at again to make sure can be completed. We, we have to leave, put everything on the table, but I will be minded more by um, the, the churches and the church leaders and the discussions that we, we should have with them on the way forward. Um, but I think it's, it's an important issue. Thank you. A sports fraternity, so the PFM. Hello. PFM Sports. Actually, there was a question about the pharmacy staff and the areas. If you can clear that one, then. Yes. Um, the pharmacists are my very good friends. Um, we, we, but you're talking about 322 pharmaceutical doctors who are threatening to sue the Ministry of Health for their allowances. Um, again, I, I want to take this one up. I'm, uh, this is the first time I'm hearing about this particular issue. Uh, I think it is Sheldon who raised it. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of it, but I think it's an important issue um, that we, we should really um, resolve. Um, so we'll, we'll talk to the Ministry uh, of Health and, and Finance. Uh, thank you very much. We'll take Kankambodu's question from the sports, I, I believe. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Good evening, Mr. Pre Vice President. Uh, before I go to my question, I'd like to draw your attention to the sad issue of the National Amputee Team. They apparently won the African Amputee Championship. They are owed per diems and bonuses and have not been paid. And they feel very neglected. And we all know that the strength of every nation is determined by how well do you treat the vulnerable in society? In your manifesto, you talk about building six new stadiums at the 
in, in the six new regions. Currently, we have five major national stadiums, and only one, that's the Kumasi Sports Stadium, is fit enough to host a FIFA or CAF organized senior national team game. So I want to know what, what motivated that decision. And since we are even struggling to maintain five, how well can we do if we have 11? Thank you. Thank you, Kankam Boidu. We do. So get a microphone to Ahini, please. It's right there. Please get a microphone to her. From the Ashanti region. Thank you. Good evening, Your Excellency. My name is Ohinini Adazwa, Sumpa TV, Sumpa Radio, Kumasi. Yeah, Rastafa. Selassie, I and I. <laughs> In your manifesto, page 24C, you did mention something about flat rate. So let's say somebody import car engines and somebody second hand clothing. Are they going to pay the same amount? I think we need better and further particulars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahini. So um that's it, Hine. Thank you, Your Excellency. My name is Dachin Henin and I was Sante from Onuya FM. Your Excellency, respectfully, uh, there is a saying that we should cry our own cry. You made a promise to teachers that you give them the opportunity of having cars. We know our minimum wage and where it stands. And the tripartite of T, view it to 18. 0.44 cities. The standard of living in Ghana is going high. Your Excellency, what will you do for 90% of people who are seated here today to carry your message on? They are journalists. Thank you. So, what's your question? For what do you do for the journalist? Is that a question? Okay. Otek. The boys here come from Otek. I shan't. Please let's hear Mr. Your Excellency, uh, I want to congratulate my MP, uh, Honorable Dr. Poki Prempe. Um, Honorable, you state, Your Excellency, sorry, you highlighted 14 key promises in your manifesto, but none of them were apportioned timelines on it. So how can you hold you accountable if not? Because it seems it be to become mere political rhetorics. Thank you. Uh, okay, Ibrahim. Ibrahim from GH1. Uh, Thank you Ibrahim, very much. GH1. Your Excellency, uh, my name is Ibrahim Al Hassan. GH1 TV Star FM. Uh, Your Excellency, um, of course, uh, forgive me for taking you back in 2016 when we were on the campaign trail. Uh, you had this declaration, and it's a very famous one. Uh, parents are suffering, students are suffering, traders are suffering, pensioners are suffering, drivers are suffering, contractors are suffering, civil servants are suffering, farmers are suffering. Fishermen are suffering, men are suffering, women are suffering, children are suffering, and Ghanaians as a whole are suffering. May I know the status of suffering of these individuals today? I'll take Vanessa from Metro TV Accra, and I'll come to Andy Kankam. So please get a microphone to Andy, and then Vanessa would speak. And I'll be come to you later. But Vanessa, Andy, then. Thank you. My name is Vanessa Idotumbo, I think, from Metro TV. Mr. Vice President, um, you will remember this quote. If the fundamentals are weak, the exchange rates will expose you. 
And as at the time you were um, making this statement, a, a dollar to um, CD was three CDs and about, or about three CDs. Four CDs, right, thank you. 2024, a dollar to a CD is 15 Ghana CDs. About 15 Ghana CDs. Okay, over 15 Ghana cities, thank you. How do I explain this to my mother, a cocoa seller, that in 2014, the fundamentals were weak. In 2024, where the dollar is now 15 cities, the fundamentals are not weak. But the prices of goods and services are high today. Thank you. Okay. Please. No, no. Yes, let Abna come and then you come. I want to hear more of the ladies at this point. Peba Chow, your family, Abna Pokua, Ahini, me Wadrum TV, and the Adrum FM. Now, my service, yes, Bakoka, Kabaka, did you kind? Peba Chow, if I see a share, Doctor Baumia, Nancy say for Frau de Ebekon, Etia Galam say. Uh, I had the answer, my no comment, and no chin. So, a front planes 2016 MPP share called four ball, a sum of the bridge, a better a from soon. So, the person who no one should say I could do cocoa sports stadium. So, the person who no baby at the piano, a war as at now, medassi. Thank you. We'll take Danaya, then His Excellency would give the responses. Please go ahead. Good evening, His Excellency. I would like my question to be answered in three, but I'll ask it in English. Ah, <laughs> sign. Please go okay, ahead. Okay, so I'll ask it in three. I, say, I just want to know, say, in the first hundred days, if Ghanaians decide to vote for you, what would be the things you would want to tackle first? Thank you. Let's take the responses and then we'll come back to, to the questions. Your Excellency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think the first question is looking at the national amputee team um, who are owed some allowances. Um, so I'll talk to the sports minister here to, to get the facts on, on, the, on the issue. And um, if that is the case, I will try to expedite their payment. Um, so I'll, 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 when I leave here, I'm going to raise that issue. Um, there's also the issue of six new stadia that, uh, and only one of the existing five is being maintained. I think that that is a very good question. Um, one of the problems we have um, is the lack of maintenance of our pitches. I met with the Black Stars in Kumasi before their last game there and when we met um, the coach and the players were very clear um, that what they really needed and this is why I have put it in our manifesto um, was an international standard pitch you know that the, the pitches that we have are difficult to, to play on and we needed international standard pitches so, in fact, in the manifesto, we need to do it. And I believe that we need professional management in terms of the maintenance of these pitches. And we need to train people um, and also bring in the people with the knowledge. Um, and so we are going to, to do that because we, we just build the pitches and there is very little main maintenance. Uh, of the pitches and, and the management of the pitches. So I think this is going to be one of the things that we are, we are going to do. The building of the uh, five other stadia, as I said, you know, we've made that commitment um, actually as far back as uh, 2019, uh, that with all these new regions that are coming on board, we will have to build stadia for them to, to encourage sports. And I believe that um, we've done uh, quite a few already in terms of the multi-purpose sports stadia. We are doing 10, we've completed six, four are almost done, 
and we are going to do another five. So, I mean, the record is there that we've done 10. I think that we can do another five um, uh, without much of a problem. Um, then the question came on the flat rate and whether second-hand clothing and spare parts will be paying the same rate. Now, I think that the categories will be different. And with the flat rate, what we want to do um, is to uh, bring a lot more predictability in import duty payment. At the moment, there isn't predictability, and there's a lot of discretion that seems to come in uh, from time to time. And so what we are saying is that we're going to bring in a flat rate in CDs. So if you are bringing in spare parts, and there's a 40-foot container of spare parts, you will know exactly what the duty is, is for the spare parts, say 20,000 CDs or 15,000 CDs or 30,000 CDs. It's a flat rate. So when the 40-foot container arrives of the spare parts, then you know you'll pay 40,000. If you are bringing in second-hand clothing, um, and that is attracting 20,000 CDs duty, you will know beforehand that it will come. It's not that it will arrive and then the price will change because they will say the exchange rate has changed so you pay more. But it will be a flat rate. So you are, there's, no, there's not going to be any confusion. Chicken will attract a different rate from, you know, uh, spare parts will attract a different rate from rice, will attract a different rate from, from second-hand clothing. But you will know beforehand, before the goods actually, before you import the goods, they will all be published. Um, and so that we get away from, uh, you know, these under-invoicing and misclassification issues. Uh, these are really hampering revenue collection. Many, many importers invest time in misclassifying. They'll bring in chicken and they'll say it is uh, fish or something. But the misclassification and so on, we, we, we will have to deal with that. Then the issue about um, cars for teachers and what we want to do for journalists and all of that. I, I really believe that one of the uh, major problems, and we address this in the manifesto, that hampers workers and livelihoods in our country is, is the fact that we operate a cash-based system. Unlike in the advanced world where they operate a credit-based system. So in up initial, life is much harder if you are a teacher in Ghana versus if you are a teacher in the US or the UK. Even if you are paid the same amount every month, the teacher in the UK will consume probably five to six times more than you, goods than you in Ghana. Why? Because they are able to obtain credit and pay over time. And so, but you, we in Ghana here, we have to accumulate cash for whatever we want to buy. If you want to buy a car and the car is costing 100,000 or 150,000, you have to look for 150,000 to pay for the car. But if you were in the UK, you'll probably be paying 1,000 every month to pay, uh, to pay for the car or much less. But so your salary goes along a much longer way. So one of the things that we are bringing in as far as uh, our manifesto is concerned is to move Ghana from a cash-based system to a credit-based system. It's very, very important because the reason why a credit-based system works in the advanced countries because they are able to compute credit scores for everybody. You know, credit scoring is key to a credit-based system because it then assesses the risk of any borrower in terms of borrowing, uh, you know, money for a fridge or a car or a TV or whatever. So the credit scoring becomes very key. Fourteen years ago, I wrote a book uh, on 
uh, monetary policy and financial sector reform in Africa. This was in 2010. And in this book, I was making the case for why uh, Ghana and Africa generally, we needed to move towards the credit-based systems. And the reason why uh, is to really bring down the stress on living uh, in our system. The reason why they are able to do what the, the credit system in the advanced countries is because the data basis exists for the computation of the credit scores. So the unique, what, what you need, a unique identity that exists, address, it exists, financial inclusion, a bank account where you can, it exists. So when we came into office, I was very clear in my mind where we wanted Ghana to go. We needed to put in place the digital address system, the Ghana card, which we have done. We needed to put in place the, digital, the address system. When we looked at the address system, um, I realized that it was going to be very difficult um, to go with what we had before, street addresses and so on. So we, I propose that we go with digital address systems. I mean, at the time, only one country in the world, Mongolia, had a digital address, a wholesale digital address system. Only one country in the world. But I said, look, Ghana should move in that direction because we can leverage on GPS technology and have a digital address system. Now, we have been able to get a digital address system, and we are the second country in the whole world to have uh, a wholesale digital address system. In every part of Ghana, we can, we can have a digital address. Now, then the, the third leg of this to, to allow us to get to credit scoring was to make sure most Ghanaians will have a bank account so that your transa financial transactions uh, can be scored and monitored and so on. But when we came in, we, I, I realized that, of course, very small percentage of people had bank accounts, but a lot of people had mobile money accounts. You know, and so I made the point that the key to get everybody financially included was to have that interoperability between the mobile money account and the bank account. And so we were able to do this uh, mobile money interoperability. And so today, Ghana now um, has all the elements. All the elements are now in place for Ghana to move to a credit-based system. All the elements are now in place. And so we expect credit score. I mean, in fact, interestingly, when I made the point that individual credit scoring doesn't yet exist in Ghana. People were uh, actually arguing, uh, saying that that wasn't true, but that is absolutely true. Uh, so we are, we, we are going to begin, you know, proper wholesale individual credit scoring, which would then provide us a basis so that, you know, people can buy their cars. And uh, I mean, someone was talking about a local um, producers and all of that. Once they know that we can offer this to teachers and they can pay over time or to journalists and they can pay over time and they don't have to bring all the cash at once, then life will be much more bearable to all of us. So my expectation is that the credit scoring system, I, I think are, mo are moving much faster than I expected. Um, but it's now manifest, we're moving to it, but I think that it's likely to be begin before the end of this year because of where we are now. I, I expect to, to launch it uh, reasonably soon because of where, where we are now. We've got everything in place, to, but that will fundamentally change everything for Ghana. Currently in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's only one country that has a credit scoring system and a credit base. That is South Africa. Ghana will be, before the end of this year, the second country in Sub-Saharan Africa with a credit base system. But it will bring down the pressure on all of our workers um, once you enter into, into that. Um, 
Then um, there, there was a question that went on the lack of timelines for the manifesto uh, in, in, in terms of promises and so on. Um, I think that when you are going for an election, <laughs> you, you are going, to, going for an election for a four-year term initially, isn't it? Yeah, so your promises have to be in line with that term of office, right? That this is what I'm, I want you to elect me to do these things, right? Um, but I think that we have a pretty good record uh, in terms of honoring our promises. We've done some work to look at our 2016 manifesto, what proportion of those promises we've honored, and it has been 83% of the 2016 manifesto has been on it, 83%. And then when you look at the 2020 manifesto, 2020, even in the midst of all this crisis, we are fulfilling or we've fulfilled 80% of our 2020 manifesto. My opponent in his 2012 manifesto, when he became president, he's only, he only fulfilled 28%. We've done the numbers. 28% of his 2012 manifesto. 280 promises. He didn't fulfill 203 of the 280 promises. He only fulfilled 28% of his promises. So I think that we have a better record as far as fulfilling promises. And when I put something down, I usually, usually have a good idea what I, how I'm going to get it done. Uh, and so that is, that is I think, um, something that we are going to, to look at. I think that the issue has come about suffering. Uh, and I remember very well, you know, my uh, statements. Uh, teachers are suffering and doctors are suffering and journalists are suffering. <laughs> And everybody is suffering in, 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 in uh, 2016, which was the case, actually, um, in, that, in that regard. But I think that we've, we've moved on significantly since 2016. And we can point to a few things that we have, because at the end of the day, you, re you you'd reduce suffering broadly by creating jobs so that you give people something to do in some social interventions to ameliorate the, the problems, the hardships that are there. So You need to look at what we have done. We've created at least 2.1 million jobs. Um, per capita income, um, in, in, as I said, you know, we, we've kept all public sector workers. We didn't lay off anyone during the, the, the COVID, and, and, and we have done, done that, and we've kept the lights on. We suffered so much from doing so. Everybody was suffering. From doing so. But we have kept the lights on. For eight years, teacher trainees were suffering. We've restored their teacher trainee allowances. Nancy trainees were suffering. We've restored their allowances. The people who were used the NHIS had major issues. The people who had sickle cell um, were suffering because the hydroxyurea, which was really needed and wasn't covered by the NHIS. Uh, today, it is uh, covered by the NHIS. Today, kidney dialysis is covered as well as childhood cancer um, was also covered. Um, you also see that for the people, the issue of rent advance, the National Rental Assistance Scheme has come in to really help uh, in that. During COVID, we gave free water for a year, free electricity. Uh, for people in the rural areas and remote areas, 
We've brought in medical drones to deliver um, medicines, vaccines, blood across 2,694 health facilities. And even recently when there was flooding uh, because of rain in the front plains, we had to um, get the drones to take examination papers uh, over there, which were not initially. Parents um, have now had the benefit of free SHS for eight years, have had the benefit of free TVET, and therefore the suffering of a lot of parents in TVs has also reduced. Um, school feeding, when we were in uh, coming in in 2016, only 1.6 million children benefited from school feeding. Today, 4 million children are benefiting from school feeding, more than double. We have also absorbed the examinees for all for BEC and, and then um, as I said before, we've doubled the number of student loan recipients from 30,000 to 58,000. We've introduced the no guarantor student loans. A lot of students who are suffering, looking for guarantors, now just need their Ghana card and they will, they will get it. You know, so we, we, so we, we have do, we've done quite a bit. In, in, uh, we've brought in one constituency, one ambulance, and we've procured the ambulances uh, for many of our uh, constituencies or many of our districts and also if you look at um, the small and medium enterprises who had major major problems in accessing um, funding uh, we've provided funding over the last eight years to 444,000 SMEs um, 1.4 billion um, which has been quite significant by any account and very historic in that, in that, in that regard. So I think that, yes, the, the, the suffering is there, uh, but we've done a lot of social interventions um, to, to ameliorate that suffering. It's not gone, but at least we can point to things that have, that have gone in to reduce the suffering of our people. I mean, even renewing National Health Insurance card was a problem. Just to renew it, you, many people had to go and sleep. I know in, in, in my constituency, people had to go to the NHI office and sometimes sleep for three days before they could renew National Health Insurance uh, membership. But today, you just sit in your home and renew. Today, you sit in your home and buy electricity credit. You don't need to take or taxi and go somewhere else to do. So we're, we're, we've done quite a bit to, to reduce the suffering of people, um, even though, of course, it is not uh, uh, complete. We still have more, more to do and we'll continue. So the other question, which is a, a nice one Vanessa was asking, if the fundamentals are weak, the skin rate will expose you which is a, a truism. It was true, true then, and it's still true today. It's an economic truism that the, the, once the fundamentals weaken, you will see the impact on the exchange rate um, fundamentally. And when we talk about uh, many of these fundamentals, you're talking about the GDP growth rate, you're talking about the fiscal balance, you're talking about the exchange, uh, the reserves, level of the reserves that you have, inflation, and so on. When we came into office, um, during the first term before we had COVID, between 2017 and 2019, you saw the fundamentals pretty much strengthening by all accounts and exchange rate depreciated in those three years by less than 5%. That was the lowest depreciation in the currency for 28 years. 28 years. That was the lowest depreciation of the currency. Um, I think we went up, uh, if, I mean, even after COVID, we, we didn't get that high a depreciation. But the biggest shock for the economy 
came in 2022. I mean, this was, I mean, all hell was breaking loose in 2022. Inflation, 54% as at November 2022. Uh, exchange rate had depreciated at 54%. I mean, and of course, you could look at the fundamentals were in trouble at that time. You saw the fiscal deficit going up. You saw inflation going up, growth uh, declining. And so for me, it wasn't uh, surprising, even though it was shocking the extent to which the exchange rate went. So the, 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 the point that, that we are making is that once the fundamentals weaken, you will get it shown in the exchange rate. Uh, and this is why we have seen that recently, uh, even though we're depreciating in November at 54%, this year the depreciation has been 18.6%. So far, right, we are, we are, we are, we are looking at 18.6%. Um, so you're looking at a, a situation this year, why, why is the depreciation lower? Because the fundamentals have strengthened. The fiscal deficit is under 5%. We are running a primary surplus uh, growth. It has gone up first quarter to 4.7%, higher than projected. The reserves are increasing. Uh, and the goal for oil program is helping. So as the fundamentals are in inflation today, is around 20%. Um, so they, 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 it's been a strengthening of the fundamentals, and you've also seen more relative exchange rate stability. I, for, I mean, in all of this, and I, 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 I want you to, to, to take this away, when I look at um, what was happening in 2022, I mean, the 54% uh, depreciation of the city, um, it was very scary. In fact, in 2022, this, this economy was on the verge of, of collapse because you saw our reserves declining very steeply. The exchange rate was blowing up. Inflation was up. And my worry at that time, frankly, was that I could see this country moving towards Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka was what was clearly in my mind at that time, because you saw protests in Sri Lanka. There are no fuel. Tumsaw was there. And when you saw the way our reserves were moving in 2022, we were heading right in that direction, that we're going to get queues on the street. We're going, we couldn't buy food. well, we couldn't pay for so many things. And it was in that context that I came up with two policies. One was the gold machine, uh, because once, when I looked at it, we were headed for disaster. You know, but I, I made the case, I looked at the numbers, and I said, well, how are we going to get foreign exchange to buy fuel in this declining reserves? And then I looked at gold. I said, let's take a look at gold. I looked at the reserves of gold that we had. And it was 8.7 tons, 8.7. That's from independence to 2022. Our gold reserves were 8.7 tons, 8.7. I mean, when you look at the US, they had 8,000 tons in, the, in, 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 the, in gold reserves. The UK, Germany, France, you know, all above 2,000, 3,000 tons. And Ghana the largest gold producer in Africa had 8.7 tons. So I said this is uh, uh, something that we need to change. And so Ghana needs to start, because the, the thing about gold for us is that we don't have to export 
anything to get gold. If we have CDs, we'll buy gold right here locally. So we can use our CDs to buy gold without needing to export cocoa or oil or diamonds or timber. We just buy the gold locally. That is what we have that many countries don't have. It's just something that we, many, many countries don't have that uh, opportunity to do so. So I then came up with the, that idea that let's do Instead of, since we don't have forex at the bank uh, to pay for um, oil, let's use gold. And therefore, we went into this gold for oil and gold purchase program for reserves. And what is very, very interesting, frankly, without this gold for oil, the gold purchase program, this economy would have collapsed. There's no doubt in my mind. There's no doubt in my mind. Why do I say so? In the last couple of years, Bank of Ghana under the Gold Purchase Program has been able to buy $5 billion of gold. $5 billion of gold. Think about it. We've gone to the IMF to look for $3 billion, which is going to be paid over three years. And this is what, why we are going through. But locally, We've been able to buy five billion. And this is why there are no queues for petrol. This is why Dumso has not happened in Ghana. Because we otherwise where would you have gotten five billion dollars from your reserves? Where would you have gotten five billion dollars from your reserves to keep up all the payments you needed to make? So um, that has been, for us, the game changer. And so the pilot, the pilot that we are seeing with the gold purchase program and the gold for oil program, I want to institutionalize it going forward. And this is why, by the grace of God, when I am president next year, we are going to, to institutionalize this. Someone asked me, oh, why is it that the French West African speak countries have not seen depreciations in their currency? Côte d'Ivoire, um, Senegal, and all of these. I said, well, they are anchored. They are, the currency is anchored to the euro through the French franc. So they are anchored. Unfortunately for Ghana, we don't have an anchor. There's no anchor for the city. So what I am going to introduce, what I want to institutionalize, is something that we have learned from this crisis. Um, you will not find it in any textbook. Maybe they will, some people will now write it in a textbook. And they are now, you won't find it in a textbook. It's not, it's not in a textbook. Because what, what I'm doing, what I'm going to do is fairly simple, as I said, but we have had to learn about it. Because what we are going to do is to say that if you want foreign exchange, and we, we've tried it already, the pilot, with some of the big companies. One big company had 3.1 billion Ghana CDs. They wanted to externalize 3.1 billion Ghana cities and they were looking for foreign exchange. Can you imagine the impact on our market? If someone comes out with 3.1 billion cities looking for dollars. So they, are, they, 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 they were trying to talk to the Bank of Ghana and all of that. So their chairman flew into the country and came to see me and said, we are having these problems and we have to ex, you know, externalize our dividends and all of that. We have 3.1 billion and we are looking for dollars. So looking for dollars from all the banks and all of that. So I listened to them and then I asked, will you take gold? They said, oh sure, gold is forex. That is not a problem. So I called the governor and said, look, why don't we put three this 3.1 billion through the gold purchase program. And guess what? It was done virtually overnight. And their money was given to them. 
So essentially, what we are, we are saying is that the demand for the dollars, you bring your cities. We have the gold. There's no doubt. I mean, the gold is there. I mean, we have five billion ounces even not yet explored, as the Geological Survey Authority has told us. That's ten trillion dollars. Right? So bring your cities, we buy the gold, give you your forex. It's that simple. So your demand for the forex will be met by an equal supply of gold, and Ghana will see stability of the currency long term. So we're looking for a simple solution to a long-term stability for the city. And that is what we are bringing in, and that is what um, is happening. What, what I'll tell you, and I'm sure maybe some of you have heard, is that other countries have started coming to Ghana to learn about our gold purchase program. Yeah, other countries have started coming. Uh, the Bank of Ghana is inundated with requests for people to come and learn as I said, this is not in textbooks, uh, but this is what we, we are doing. So I, I think that the fundamentals ultimately has an impact on the exchange rate, and that, but the crisis that we have gone through has now made us to think a bit outside the box and, and, and bring in this new solution. Now, Abna uh, was asking about Galamse and what we are doing about it. And I, and I, Ta yo. Any maminka chi kakra. Um Galamse no asamin by a kakra kakra. Um ye perse yes sir gala and she share a war ye mining sector. Um say say see Galamse for omin ni uh, permit licenses uh ye de mo ye be sesa um sanchi cheno ye be ye na easy mrepa ma obi a o ye galamse ene obi nya mining license a o be o de be ye juma so ye de sam ranaba district committees traditional leaders through the minerals commission o mo be nya licenses o mo be register ne o mo gana card then you be here community mining schemes. Geological survey authority. Best you share omu survey no. No omu who say a hana gold no war, a hana gold no, and they said they omu to gold no. A trial and error. Ubaku wako to her we nya no wako ha we nya no na u say as I say no. But ye the data ba na ya kind of say galam say for uh or small scale miners. Hana gold no walk into ye shisha community mining scheme or amam monko ho muntu to omu ya naya to omu gold no a dia ko bank of ghana and see san shisha no na yede ba minerals development bank ama mining small scale mining sector also said the agreed development bank here yes no for if you have no yes new minerals development bank ama small scale miners na abuwa omu no omu inya equipment yet the um common use are there a friend common user facilities if you did be a to go no how do now who the shame one a ye high percentage of gold amount so i'm not here but to go in the community mining schemes said so, um, more gold uh, from their activities and he um sa yes it's a share basua maybe you did say galam easy obia excavator na yes you know that or whatever so you know every castle lady um I heard about the front planes and then Coco. I don't know. I can't, I, I, I'm missing the front planes question. Abina, Up. The, ah, the bridge. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. The bridge. Uh -huh. And now, uh, and Coco Sports Stadium. Twenty-two. 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 Tw
Yes. So the front planes bridge, I think it's uh, one of the bridges that is, we are working under with the Korean facility. It's one of the projects that we've presented to, to be done under the Korean facility. When we say the Koreans have given us a grant and a, 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 a concessional loan of $2 billion. And, and we've had to take a number of projects to, to them for funding. I think that bridge over there from is, is one of them. And then um, the Nkoko Sports Stadium, I have to follow up with the minister on that one. I can't give you a direct answer on that. Um, <clears throat> then the uh, question came, the first 100 days, uh, what would you do? Uh, I'm definitely not taking a honeymoon. Um, <laughs> We are, we are going to get straight to work to put things in place. I, I think that for me, um, the, the focus is on jobs. And so you have to put in um, the budget as quickly as possible so that you can uh, make sure that you know, the tax amnesty regime comes into place, the flat tax regime comes into place, um, so that by the time your, of your first budget in March, um, these things, the Ghana first, buy Ghana first policy, uh, that we put it in uh, and pass the law so that we can get the, the Ghana first policy. The e-levy will go uh, uh, because we have to uh, focus on digitalization of, of uh, the economy and, and so we need to to, to take out uh, the, the e-levy as well. You know, so these are some of the things that I, I believe that we can, we can do uh, very, very, very quickly uh, as we come in um, you know, to, within the first 100 days. But I think that uh, we are going to be very, very hard at work uh, to, to, to look at things that get business moving, the tariff structure for, for the uh, businesses, commercial versus residential, we, we have to look at it. The flat rate regime has to come in immediately. Those things that will get business moving very quickly to create the jobs um, are the things that we are going to do immediately so that we are serious about business and serious about job creation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. I will go to the far end. Um, Abdel. Abdel from Tamale, please. Let's hear from the northern region. Abdel, go ahead. Thank you so much. My name is Abdel Shakur of mine. I work with Dabong FM in Tamale. Your Excellency, um, my question is, the teacher and nursing allowances increases the expenses of the public purse. As an economist, don't you think it is prudent for us to scrub it, especially so you are now talking of an upgrade instead of a research? Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me hear from Salma. Salma, please go ahead. Please give the microphone to Salma. Um, good evening, Your Excellency, and thanks for the opportunity. My name is Salma Ahmed of um, Ikra Radio. Um, Your Excellency, having advocated for the creation of the Zongo Development Fund, how impactful has it been to the Zongo and the inner cities? Thank you. Umar Risanda from City. Thank you so much. Good evening, Mr. Vice President. I have a message from your in-laws, the Fulani people. <laughs> they say I should tell you that, and remind you rather, that they are still being discriminated against when it comes to obtaining national ID cards, the passport, and so on. So kindly work on the discrimination part for them. My question, your critics, mostly the NDC, they say that the economy has overused, so you run away to digitalization. What is your response to such a criticism? Thank you so much. Anybody from Savannah region? Savannah, 
Savannah is there. Please give your microphone to the gentleman from Savannah. Thank you. Your Excellency, my name is Nongya Isaac Nongya from Joinu Savannah region. You did a lot of justice to the policies we put under agriculture. But one fundamental key on the agri value chain, which is the seed industry, is crushing to collapse. I will speak. The local seed industry is very, very weak to the extent that seed growers are out of business. The Tamale Warehouse, one warehouse. There are a lot of seeds that are packed there with a market. Sorry. Your, qu your question, your question, please. My question is, are you going to rescue the agricultural value chain by revamping the local seed industry and then giving quota of supply of these seeds to the plan for a food or job? Because at the moment, they only buy rice in the neglect of maize, soya, and what have you. Thank you. Let's hear from Frima Edunyame from Channel 1, and then we'll come to Central Region. So let's hear from Frima. We'll come to Central Region. Thank you very much. Um, Your Excellency, it is quite clear that Dr. Mahmoud Baumia is not the visionary for the current NPP administration. But as rightly admitted, you bear some collective responsibility for the outcomes of government efforts, either successes or failures. Mr. Vice President, can you state two failures of your current administration which you seek to correct? And how do you intend to do this differently should you become the president? Thank you. Thank you. Central Region. Your Excellency, my name is Kofi Kunedu from ATLFM UCC Cape Coast. I guess the uh, Cape Coast Airport promise in 2020 is part of the 20% unfulfilled. Fast forward, you have uh, aligned in your 2024 manifesto. It means it is there in your heart. What is the overriding consideration of having an airport in Cape Coast and for that matter, Central Region? Thank you. Please, let me hear from Larry Dugwe. Please give the microphone to Larry. And then afterwards, we'll come to Ashanti Region, Mr. Kwame Edinkra. Let's take a few more. Give the microphone to Mr. Kwame Edinkra. His hand has been up for a bit now. Please. I see a lot of hands. We'll take as many as we can. Please be very crisp with the questions. Okay. Yes, Excellency, I want an assurance. I recall the president first hundred days in office. I drew his attention to a vision of President Jara Jukumku for to the fact that he will fix the inner ring road of Kumasi to restore the Garden City glory. In fact, we saw the Asqua interchange, the overhead constructed. We saw improvement in the Sofola interchange. Now we have seen major constructions at the Swami interchange. But we have left with Santasi runabout interchange, Ahonjo runabout interchange, Aulaga Junction interchange, and airport runabout interchange to fully complete the inner ring road of the Garden City. I want assurance from you to the people of Kumasi whether indeed in your reign as the President of the Republic you will fully complete the inner ring road of the garden city thank you very much thank you i see andy please give the microphone to andy and larry they must ask questions please hand the microphone over to andy and larry wherever they are i see them
Yeah, there, I see them here. Oh? Yes, hello. Please hand the microphone over to them. <laughs> Thank you. Andy, please join your brother. Please come forward. Go ahead. Mr. Vice President, I'm from Akachi in the Volta region. Andy is from Jachi, somewhere in Kumase. So we can't be. <laughs> we can't be brothers. But by the way, this is it's very difficult to hear the MPP talking about the fight against corruption. I don't know whether that has been captured in the manifesto. If it has, can you throw a little light on it for us, please? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. You've been touted as one with integrity. And we know integrity is anchored on trust. On your campaign tour, you're making promises. In some instances, a renew of those you've made in the past. Thankfully, you've been reminded of one you made in 2016 to relieve Ghanaians of the suffering. Seven years down the line, there is still suffering. This time around, excruciating hardship. You are appealing to Ghanaians to promote you to the higher office of the land. Respectfully, respectfully, do you think you should be trusted with a mandate that you are or you, you, you have what it takes to relieve Ghanaians of what they are going through? Thank you. Thank you, Andy. So basically the question is that between Dr. Mahmoud Baumia and former President Mahama, who should a Ghanaian voter trust? He would respond to it. Please give the microphone to Nana Okatechi Afrifa. Okay, it's with, it's with Ivan. So let Ivan come then. Okatechi will come then. Uncle Ebukwansa will come. Okay. My name is Evans Mensa. I work with Joy News. On page 29 of your manifesto, you promise to protect Ghanaian cultural values. My question to you is as president, will you sign the promotion of Ghanaian sexual rights and family values bill. Thank you. Okay, I think we're taking more than the, the six at this point. Uncle Bukwansa, please let us hear from Akateji if you father come to Uncle Bukwansa. Good evening, Your Excellency. As usual, I would like to ask my question in three. Say how are you? I am not sure if you are going to be able to answer this Your Excellency, a year na me free a year as an Gregor and an important more ever. Now, me call it with Madame for our non suya morning show of a year Kesman Kwame Apia Kubi. You could do honor near Mana El Kosuni B, Your Excellency. It is heart wrenching. Seminoka say, turn on Sio Idaho is to top break. Meet me in the middle of the tunnel in Sio, no man until so. Domine Jesus Christ. That is how bad the destruction of our waters have become. Enra, we have to turn ourselves into citizen vigilantes to arrest some Chinese people and send them to the police station on this matter. Besides that, Achimota Forest, Yanyan TSA, a year the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, said. Year in, year out, a certain old family, Aya Jia Sasi, free on Monsem 1927, Yen Chia Moka, and T. Omo Dibi Koma, old family, no. Your Excellency, where there any question? A ya chopper, a chimota for a seer, the old family be car, a binding chia old family in a car, na forest, no, and na ho. Name of your issue, your forest, said your year see, say no in our quest to benefit from the natural resource of this country i don't think we can continue like that as a nation 
Sebeya, Yosua, Yaseno, Abedri, you bet me a reclaiming, nay, you bet me a body, that one over by Amada Chinchima. Thank you. Please let's take Uncle Bokwansa so we can, because I think that we've taken almost nine or so questions. Uncle Bokwansa, we do Sadik from NTV and then we will take the answers. Thank you. Please. Mr. Vice President and incoming President. About three years ago, I attended your lecture at Bekusu. When I came back, my feature was simple. The headline was simple. A Bokwansa attend lecture and encounters the next president. Some of us are already convinced that you are going to be the president of Ghana. <laughs> but the, some people out there are campaigning that you are a liar. All over the rural areas, when you go and you talk about your you know achievement and what you intend doing the old folks will say ah but the people came here and said you are a liar now you are telling us that you are um you represent the future please how do you convince my elder sister in my village that uh, you should get up uh, an 82 year old lady that you should get up drag herself and go and vote for a man who is for the future. I just want you to tell the people of Ghana who you are, why you want to be president of this republic. Thank you. Thank you, Sadek, NTV, and then His Excellency will take, would now give the answers from Sadek. From Northern TV. Yes. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, Tamale is one of the fastest growing cities in West Africa. Over the years, we've had perennial water challenge. Your government cancelled for the Tamale water project in 2020, same for Yendi and Savannah region. Your Excellency, as President of the Republic, what will be your solution to address this perennial water challenge? And what is the update on the Tamale water project? Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, if you can take the questions and give the answers. But please let me quickly add this. As we report, kindly let's report fairly. If you are going to report that the, the Vice President said, if he does everything now, what would he do when he becomes President? Please add the laughing emoji and then complete the statement. Because that's exactly what he said. TV3, kindly correct the reportage on Facebook. Thank you. Your Excellency. Thank you very much. I think um, the question started with the seeds. I think that the seed industry um, appears to be collapsing, and we need to revamp the local seed industry. I, I couldn't really agree more with, um, with the, the whole um, premise of, of that. If, if, if that is the case, um, we ne definitely will need to revamp the local seed industry because without the seeds, we, we have a real problem in terms of um, cultivation of various crops. So we'll have to, to look at that. Um, the question, what sort of, what failures that you think in this government that you will see to correct? Um, I was thinking a little bit about that. I don't know if, if I mean, for one, for one I, I, I think that um, I, I wish we had built in, for example, we had started the gold purchase program much earlier. Um, if we had started it in our first term of office, for example, the buffer in terms of gold reserves would have been much, much uh, bigger. As I said, a few years ago we had 8.7 tons of gold and I think so far we are almost uh, getting, they've bought close to about 72 tons or so. So it's very, I mean, something that I wish when I sit back and look and I say, wow, I wish we had, we had been able to, to buy a bit more uh, and start 
uh, gold for oil and, and gold for reserves uh, much, much earlier. Um, but as I said, the crisis is what really made us to, to get into these, these policies. Um, of course, I also um, wish that we had, uh, even though we built more school infrastructure than any government, I believe that um, we've had, uh, still had challenges um, with the uh, senior high school in terms of infrastructure. Uh, and I wish we had completed a bit more in terms of the accommodation, dining hall, and so on. But this is one of the reasons why um, I want us to move a lot of the uh, government expenditure away from government to the private sector. This is a major policy that we are coming up with, that we want to engage the private sector in a lot of expenditure that government normally will put on the budget. And a lot of infrastructure is part of what government puts uh, on the budget in places like roads, and, and you tend to see a lot of uncompleted buildings. But if you go to places like Legon or Tech, most of the accommodation, the hostels, is provided by the private sector. And all we do is rent it and pay. And I believe that we can have that model where the private sector is engaged to, to, to build a lot of infrastructure and will pay them um, uh, rent or lease it or whatever over time. So I believe that will give a lot of uh, fiscal space, but also allow us to complete all of these buildings and so on. But this is where I want to take uh, uh, Ghana in the next session, that we should move more towards the private sector provision of a lot of this, and that will really bring down the fiscal burden on government in providing some of these. The Cape Coast Airport, uh, what is the overriding consideration? Well, I think that if you look at tourism, it's got to be one of the big considerations for, for, for Cape Coast. Um, and, and, and that um, could provide us, of course, some people say, well, you are also expanding the road. That, that is fine. But if some people want to fly directly to Cape Coast. I think they will have that opportunity to do so, um, parents, uh, it's, an, it's an educational hub and so on from Tamba Lake and come straight to Cape Coast um, and other things. So I think that, you know, they, there is a, a rationale um, and, and, and we, 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 should, we should give uh, Cape Coast. Uh, it's the feasibility study is suggesting that uh, the location will really be between Cape Coast and, and, and Takradi because of land space issues, but I think there's uh, justification for that. Inner Ring Road for Kumasi, Santasi, Amojo, uh, and airport interchanges. Um, Napo, uh, I'll leave you to handle that portfolio. Um, <laughs> and it will be your responsibility to make sure So I'll tell the Kumasi people to hold you if it's not done. Um, I think that um, the, the issue of, uh, that has been raised, uh, I think, I don't know if it was Andy or, or Larry who raised it, uh, that corruption, that we are not, we've not talked about corruption in, in, in the manifesto. In fact, we have, and I did um, make the point when I, I delivered my speech at the um, manifesto launch. Uh, that, you know, for, for me, the way we have looked at fighting corruption, um, to, you know, we, we are looking at, as I said during the manifesto launch, we have killed people for corruption, we killed people, we've passed several laws, you know, in fact, since we have been in office, you know, um, we have passed many laws. We've passed the Right to Information Act, that basically brings more transparency. The Witness Protection Act we've passed. The Criminal Offense Amendment Act 2020 was also passed. The Anti-Money Laundering Act 2020. They also increased budgetary allocations 
to the audit service, to Shrage, NCCE. He also set up the office of the special prosecutor. So all of these things are, um, you know, policies that we've implemented. But I make the point that when it comes to corruption, I believe that we should stop correct corruption ex ante. That is before it happens, rather than deal with it ex post after it happens. That we should look at, and this is why I believe that digitalization holds the key to dealing with corruption. And why do I say so? When I look at the impact of the Ghana Khan on the public sector payroll, it gives me a lot of confidence that we are on the right path to deal with corruption ex ante. The Ghana Khan provides unique identity backed by fingerprints for every in adult Ghanaian so far. We've issued 18 million Ghana cards. And so when we look at SNIT, for example, when they went through their pensioner payroll and tried to make sure that everybody had a unique identity on the payroll, they found out 29,000 ghost pensions just because of the Ghana card. And that saved SNIT almost 400 million Ghana cities from the 29,000. National Service Secretariat found 44,000 ghost service personnel, savings of over 350 million. And using digitalization and the Ghana card, we've been able to eliminate all ghost workers on the controller and accountant general payroll. And that is a major advancement in the fight against corruption because these are things that have been there um, for a very, very long time. But digitalization is helping us to deal with it. And when you come to the area of the tax, um, um, domestic revenue mobilization and people's um, compliance with tax laws and, and all of that. When we came into office, only 4%, only 4% of the, what do you call it, adult population of Ghana had tax identification numbers. Only 4% had tax identification numbers. So we made the decision, I said, look, why don't you make the Ghana card number the tax identification number? Suddenly, once we did that, suddenly 85% of adults in Ghana suddenly have tax identification numbers. So we can tell going forward who has filed, who hasn't filed, where they live, and so on. We tackled corruption, passport office, with digitalization. And since we digitalized operations at the passport office, Revenues have gone up almost ninefold at the passport office. Ninefold. Same with DVLA, digitalizing DVLA. We've seen significant increase in revenue. We digitalize ECG, and ECG no longer collects cash for payment of electricity. You've seen revenue collections go up from 450 million Ghana cities to 1.2 billion Ghana cities. Yes, by digitalization. You are looking at paperless ports and the, 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 the way um, clearing goods at the ports have gone so far. Everybody can attest that you have been able to see a reduction in corruption. The Ghana.gov platform that we have implemented by the way, you, you, almost about 99% of all MMDAs are on the Ghana.gov platform. And that means that payments to government are, 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 are largely not leaking. The, the Ghana.gov is collecting about 200 billion Ghana CDs on the platform a year. And a lot of this would have normally gone through cash, and then we would have had leakages. Um, 
what we want to do uh, moving forward with fighting corruption is my proposal in the manifesto that our government must become a blockchain government. A blockchain government which means that we operate on the basis that all transactions that you do within the government space are locked and cannot be changed, are traceable, even if it is 100 years, they are all traceable. So you cannot go and change any things within the government space. And that is where we need to go. So far, UAE wants to be the world's first blockchain government. They are on course. Ghana wants to be the world's second blockchain government. With, with that, I think there's, once everything is transparent in all your transactions, there should be a, a deterrence um, for corruption in this context. So I, I want us to move in, into blockchain and, and it will also be done. Um, just like Estonia, I also want all our databases to be interoperable. Um, and, and that is work that is going on now. Uh, and I believe that uh, either later this year or next year, we will have across all of the government space, all data between one institution and the other will be interoperable so that we'll see and there will be more transparency. In addition, I have made the statement that I want us to enact a Corrupt Practices Act to consolidate all the anti-corruption related legislation and offenses that are currently scattered across several pieces of legislation so that we have an omnibus body of provisions offering anti-corruption institutions a harmonized reference point to draw their mandate. I also want us to continue the process of restructuring the public sector and internal audit function. I want us to review Article 286 of the Constitution and the relevant legislation on assets and liabilities declaration. I want to expand the asset declarations by public office holders to include, among others, senior staff and heads of regulatory and public institutions which were not previously covered. And I also want to require that asset declarations be made or updated every two years instead of every four years. I want to place limits on foreign official travel by ministers, CEOs, and civil servants, as well as annually publish official travels undertaken. And also annually publish the list of all beneficiaries of public scholarships. So that is one area in terms of um, um, the corruption fight that is in the manifesto. Maybe um, it must have skipped some people, uh, but it is, it is there. Um, I think uh, it is Han Andy who was asking the question that, you know, all the promises are about integrity and trust um, and, and, and the fact that real hardships exist and how would people trust that I will be able to, to work on, on the hardships. I think that you know, the issue has to, to really be about what have you done? I mean, what is your track record on these issues of social intervention, right? What have we done to relieve hardships? I think, frankly, um, uh, the MPP, whether it's President Kufuor's government or President Kufuor's government, has a solid record when it comes to social interventions to deal with hardships. Uh, the record is very, very solid, whether you're talking in education, with capitation grants, or the increase in the um, uh, payments to persons with disabilities, we grant about 50% of free SHS or a free TVET or increased uh, absorption of BC and um, WACSI examination fees, 
and so on. The, 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 the free water during COVID and all of that. The social interventions are very, very uh, massive, actually. The, the, the issue with my opponent, um, who is a former president, is that he cannot point to one social intervention, one, that, that he can point to that this is how I, notwithstanding all that has gone on, when I was president, I was able to do this to relieve the suffering of our people. There's just not one, you know, uh, there's not one social intervention. So that is the, the issue, I believe that if you look at our promises, as I said, the 2016 manifesto, we've done about 83% and 80% uh, of the 2020 manifesto fulfilling or fulfilled about 80%. Uh, so we have more credibility, and I think the people of Ghana can trust us. Um, where when it comes to dealing with hardships, uh, we, we are always front and center, whether it's providing free dialysis or uh, sickle cell or childhood cancer, we're always thinking about it. And for me personally, you know, I always worry about the poor and the vulnerable. And this is why I am a patron, for example, of the Lepers Aid Ghana and also for the Mother Teresa's soup kitchen in, in a crime, also a patron there, because I want to help people who are vulnerable, and that, that's where my heart really is. So I think we can, we can do a whole. Then you have, um, I think it's Evans, who are uh, protecting Ghanaian cultural values uh, and so on. I think that is very, very important, and he he asked whether the bill, when it comes, I will sign it. I mean, the, the bill is before uh, the Supreme Court right now, um, and I think once the Supreme Court brings it, I think there are certain challenges that have been made to it, uh, that it uh, to say that it is not consistent with the Constitution or whatever. But of course, we will wait for it to come, uh, and, and, and once it's, it's out of the Supreme Court, and and they declare it as, as constitutional. Uh, I believe that the signing is automatic. Uh, there shouldn't be any issue. No ifs and no buts. Bamu <laughs> yada. Um, I think that there is the issue of um, protecting our water bodies, um, and I think that, first of all, restoration of our uh, forests, you know, we've undertaken uh, to, to target about 30,000 hectares of degraded areas for reforestation and plantation, and also establishing a 1,000 hectare bamboo, bamboo and rattan plantations annually for uh, watershed protection and also providing tree seedlings and plantain stackers in the National Reforestation and plantain, uh, Plantation Program. I've also talked about small-scale mining and how we want to reduce the practice of Galamse indiscriminate digging by using data from the Geological Survey Department to direct the miners into particular community mining schemes um, uh, and, 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 and sort of using uh, mercury-free gold catcher machine technology uh, to help them extract the gold without destroying the water bodies. Um, we also want to preserve our water resources by vigorously protecting both the surface and underground sources by enforcing the provisions of the water use regulations um, and protecting transborder water sources uh, of the Volta River in particular. Uh, we need to effectively uh, manage all these uh, uh, water basins. Uh, I think it's very, very important that we do so. I think that um, 
I think, I think, I don't know if it was a book answer, who was asking the question. Um, He's addressed it. it. What exactly about ah, Achimoto, Achimoto Forest? Forest yeah. He, he, he talked about uh, the Owu family um, that they should, um, he's saying that, you know, whatever we can do to pay off the old family and preserve the forest we should yes. do. I'm inclined to, to agree with you on, on that. It was a suggestion. It yes, wasn't it a was question. a suggestion, yeah. Yes, it wasn't a question. No, 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 it wasn't. It yes. Was, it was the, a suggestion that if, the, if we can preserve the forest without um, um, getting it chopped down and all of that, I think makes... Thank you, Excellency. Um, Umaru Sanders, yeah. about the Fulani discrimination yeah. And also the issue of you speaking only on digitalization and no longer on the economy. Yeah, I, I think we're coming to that. Um, and uh, let me see. Yeah, okay. I, let me let me take on this question. I wrote it, but I can't seem to see it. Uh, but I mean, the issue of my in-laws. Um, <laughs> my, my in-laws feeling discriminated against. Uh, I, I will take very strong exception to that. <laughs> as president, I, I, and even as vice president, I don't think I, will, I, will, I want to see my in-laws discriminated against. So Marosan, tell them that uh, we are going to fight with them to make sure that dis discrimination doesn't take place. Uh, then also, you talked about digitalization, my focus on digitalization, and that the, the people think that I've run away from economics. And it is, economics has gone over me, and so I have gone to digitalization. I think digitalization has gone over them. You know. They, 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 they have no, there's very, it's very strange, you know, that the people cannot see the nexus between digitalization and the economy. And it just, does, it just doesn't make sense. You know, when I spent a year at Oxford University in 2009 as a, a, a researcher in the economics department, I wrote a book uh, um, on monetary policy and financial sector reform. And I made a point in the book, this was in 2010, this is 14 years ago before I became vice president. I made the point that Africa needs to go digital because the global economy is going digital. And if countries stay behind, they will miss out on the fourth industrial revolution as we missed out on the other revolutions. And there's a good reason, because the digitalization allows us to formalize our economy. Informal economies are very difficult to manage. And, and so if you want systematic you know, management of an economy based on data and based on systems, the fourth industrial revolution a data-based revolution. You know, if you have an economy that doesn't have data and systems, you can't do much. Your entry into you have a digital identity. You know your population. Today, when a child is born in Ghana, right, you, at the point of way in, they give the child a Ghana card ID as well as a birth certificate ID. We are the first country in Africa to, do, to get this done. You are getting these two IDs. So and in a, in, in a not, long, not long, we are going to see NIA is going to go to all the schools and issue all the children with Ghana card IDs. So we will have a complete database. You know, and they've done the pilot, so I expect them to start before the end of this year. You have a complete database of the whole country. Everybody is accounted for. If a child is not in school, you will know. 
because they will not be in the school database, but they would have been born. You know, you can only manage an economy when you have the data on the people, you know, properly. So I think that the digitalization allows us to do so. From independence to 2016, only 4% of our people had tax identification numbers. Only 4%. But by making the Ghana card ID, that, that, that we've been able to solve that problem, and therefore we have 85% in there. How do we get everybody with a bank account? You go through mobile money interoperability. You get the digital framework, and then suddenly Ghana is the number one country in terms of financial inclusion. We've been working at this matter since independence. But Ghana is 100% access to financial inclusion. The only country in Africa with 100% access to financial inclusion. We've been, I mean, this is economics. <laughs> when you talk about financial inclusion, you are talking about economics. Look at the savings that people are making. Just staying at home and paying their, their electricity bill or renewing their national health insurance or buying something on the internet or whatever. Just you know, you are expanding economic possibilities uh, when you move in this direction and so on. So when you are talking about uh, moving away from economics, no, in fact, any economy uh, which doesn't digitalize will be left behind. And so I believe right now what we are doing right now in Ghana, we are really at the forefront of the digital economy. In, in, in Africa. We are the forefront of the digital economy. What we are doing right now, many, many countries are not able to do. Many, many countries will take a much longer time to do. Um, I was telling somebody, even in the UK, they don't have digital ID cards. Tony Blair was proposing to uh, Steiner that they should move to issue digital IDs. They don't have digital IDs in the United States. They are now talking about doing digital identity in the United States. The EU has asked all their countries to make sure they issue digital IDs by 2030. You know, how do you manage an economy without address systems? Addresses. If you go to the UK, US, Canada, and you collapse the address system, Today, those economies were caused just because we don't have addresses. We had to address that problem. For 60 years of independence, we've been bringing in the Ghana Post GPS and moving to a digital property address system. Ghana solved that problem just like that. You know, and that has economic repercussions. Uh, you know, you, you, you look at Ghana.gov, all these people on one platform, look at the efficiency. And all, so many problems that we are, we've lived with since independence, so many problems since independence, we have been able to solve them because of digitalization. And this is now going to give us the foundation to really grow jobs, grow jobs and the businesses in this country. That is where we are going. So people who don't understand digitalization or, uh, um, need to you know, think through some of these things. This is where um, the world is going. And I am just, you know, at the forefront in terms of policy of moving this in this country. Um, and that is why some people don't understand. You know, what I, and then I think Ebukwansa was talking about uh, people calling me a liar. And then you go, you know, and, and that is very, I said to someone, well, uh, at least I'm not called a murderer, as my boss was called, or... I'm not called a drug dealer, or even I'm not called government official one. <laughs> you know, uh, but why do I, I mean, do these things arise? Fundamentally, I believe that Ghana can do exactly what is happening in the developed world, in the advanced country. I believe it is possible for us to leapfrog technology 
and, and, and for us to do this, we must have this mindset of possibilities. That's why I'm saying it is possible. We are always, you know, timid in trying to, to do things that are not even done in the advanced countries. We think because it's not been done in the advanced countries, we shouldn't even try. But we can leapfrog them in many areas. So, but if you have an impossibility mindset, which seems to have been pervasive in the NDC mindset, everything you want to do, they say it's not possible. But if you have that, your development is limited. But when other countries are going to Mars, uh, uh, why would you think earthly things are not possible? But many of the things, many of the things that I, uh, I, I have, I'm trying to do um, in, in the policy space are a little futuristic in nature. Many people don't seem to usually understand them at the time when I start talking about them, they, they immediately come and say, oh, well, he, he's lying. But you remember when I talked about drones coming into Ghana, what did they say that uh, I was lying, that uh, the drones are coming to take pictures of naked women in their bathrooms? I, I mean, that was the, the, the <laughs> response about drones. Uh, and when I said Ghana was the world's largest medical drone delivery service. They said, ah, they, he's lying, it's not true. Well, when we talked about digital property address system, they said he was lying, you know. This is not this thing. When I said that um, <laughs> mobile money interoperability, Ghana was the first in Africa to do mobile money interoperability of, between bank accounts and the Momo account that we have done, uh, they said I was lying, you know, and then, but usually after they say I'm lying, when I'm proven right, they don't come back to say I was right. When I said that you could use the Ghana card to travel from outside Ghana into Ghana, they said I was lying. Today, people are using it and, tra and traveling very easily. When we, I said we're going to build hostels for Kaya Ye, they said I was lying. And then we've built the hostels, they've not said anything. Um, when I said we will restore teacher training allowances, they said I was lying. Um, when I talked about the uh, rent advance loans so that people will not have to pay rent advance through the National Rental Ass Assistance Scheme, they said I was lying. Um, free SHS, when we talked about it, they said it was 419. Uh, agenda 111, when I mooted this idea about Agenda 111 and we announced it, they said it was a lie, it was not feasible. Um, the digital, uh, the Zungo Development Fund similarly, and when I talked about credit scoring, uh, that was not in existence, it, hasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, seen as, uh, as true, you know. So there, there's a pattern that is uh, going on, but I have to thank Joy FM. Um, in June uh, 2023, Joy FM did a report together with the African Academy for Open Source Investigations, and they, that report revealed that the coordinated sharing of that hashtag Bawulaya tweets by 28 accounts using copy and paste technique in an inorganic, uh, is an inorganic creature created by the opposition NDC to smear me. This was the finding of, of Joy FM, not me, that they had created uh, these fake accounts um, and sharing Baulaya tweets and, 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 and they had said that this, is, um, this was a deliberate attempt by the NDC to smear me. So I take it uh, as par for the course. I have a solid record of accomplishment as vice president. Very solid. <clears throat> I have at least, I can point to 33 separate policy initiatives. 33. 
that I have championed or initiated as vice president. 33. My opponent cannot point to one. One. Just one. Just one. One. One single policy initiative as a vice president. One. He can't. I mean, if you are serious about solving the problems of this country, at least you must think of something. You must think of something. You cannot just be eating and going to sleep every day. You must think of something. You must be policy oriented. I mean, we are, we are put into public office to solve problems. You cannot be there as MP, as minister, as vice president, as president, and you don't have a policy initiative. Just one. I mean, you need your leaders to be problem solvers. So you must have thought through problems and come up with initiatives to solve the problems. I can talk about 33 different policy initiatives. My opponent cannot talk of one. And he wants to be given the mandate. 